institutions to really get a wide cross-section of patient perspectives about um, how participants view specific consents uh, as a requirement for sharing of biosamples and data for future research, uh, to understand which biospecimen and biobanking related research practices are likely to have the greatest impact on willingness to participate. So um, the group is hard at work at uh, undertaking uh, this survey, and I think we'll hear more about that in the near future. But this survey is likely to have uh, really important implications for thinking about uh, future policy for uh, ethical conduct of human research, I think fairly broadly across a uh, biomedical research space, another important contribution of eMERGE. Uh, privacy has been an important part of that, and everybody knows that Brad Mallon from Vanderbilt and the Coordinating Center has been very actively involved in a variety of uh, privacy projects to model what the concerns are, to think about measuring risks, and more importantly, to think about how to mitigate those risks without uh, in any way seriously interfering with um, the uh, ability to conduct the research. And I'll just mention one example of that, which is a natural language processing de-identification at local sites to minimize the risk of uh, information. And they've developed freely available software uh, called MIST uh, that was developed in a partnership between eMERGE members and MITRE, uh, which is a tool that's available that we think actually can be broadly rolled out that would help um, be one example of how one might think about de-identifying and reducing the risks of um, uh, re research using electronic health records information. And Brad and his team continue to make important innovations uh, in that area. Finally, I want to just uh, spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, the Emerge PGRN partnership. Um, this is an uh, exciting uh, recent development uh, supplement that has come to emerge. It's a collaboration that brings the capabilities um, from the PGRN network in terms of a resequencing platform, um, the PGRN seat platform for 48 uh, important uh, pharmacogenes, uh, the drug gene guidelines that the CPIC uh, standards have developed and bring that together with the EMR information uh, capabilities of uh, the eMERGE network to produce the eMERGE PGX project where the goals are to deploy the VIP platform uh, across the eMERGE network, apply to participants enriched for encountering drugs for which their CPIC guidelines, develop methods for returning appropriate genotype results through appropriate decision support tools to our participants assess the utility and validity of that and how the participants, both the physicians and the patients, uh, respond to uh, this kind of a process. And then, uh, in addition to archive novel variants for further study, uh, these are the uh, genes that um, PGX candidate drug gene pairs that are being implemented at least at some of the sites across the eMERGE network. These are the ones for which there's actually uh, good CPIC guidelines. And um, then ultimately recruit and collect samples. That's well underway. Some of the sites have already completed their recruitment to undertake the PGRN se sequencing. That's also well underway. Quite a bit of sequence data has already been returned to the sites. They're currently analyzing the clinical variant uh, information behind that and beginning to develop uh, EHR integration. I think that's well along at many of the sites. Uh, there are uh, surveys that are underway of both patient and clinician education. And um, the first uh, rollout of Sphinx, the uh, variant and phenotype data repository that will hold uh, this clinical in the, the, uh, these variants, especially the ones that, that um, are, are novel. Discovered. They are very poorly implemented record, very poorly understood by clinicians, very poorly supported um, in a lot of different ways. But on the discovery side, I am a believer in the GWAS hits. And I think even though you, you know, I mean, you can make risk scores, but even though a lot of them don't translate immediately to clinical care, you are finding genes that you didn't know were part of the process. So for example, with the herpes zoster, um, David Crossland's analysis found um, 
that variants in the same gene that causes resistance to HIV infection um, affect your risk of getting zoster, and that was genome-wide significant. So this is putting you to biology you just didn't know about that can translate down the road. And so I, I am a believer in that, and I think that this is a unique resource to, to look at phenotypes nobody else has or can look at. And so I think there is a real important work still done there. Um, how that translates to implementation, I, I, I'd rather do some sequencing and get some. <laughs> and so, so, so maybe you're saying that, uh, that our future should be sequencing. Instead of, instead of Personally, I think that if we're going to move forward, and it's particularly are interested in implementation, that sequencing is, um, is more clinically relevant right now. So, so I guess I would Mark, uh, I'll just make two comments. One is I don't think it's an either or because I think as Gail pointed out, um, you know, sequencing is all well and good, but there's huge amounts of data. And to some degree, if you can identify potential um, genes of interest through GWAS where you can then look at sequence variation within those genes, that's, they're going to be complementary, not um, uh, you know, it, it, one or the other. The second thing is just to get back to your question about the actual clinical implementation. Uh, we used our phenotype uh, around abdominal aortic aneurysm to develop uh, some uh, uh, genomic uh, information and, and variant information that we are currently combining with clinical information as a predictive algorithm for those that should be more aggressively contacted and screened for development of abdominal aortic aneurysm. So I think there are some examples where uh, these uh, genomic risk factors that are identified through GWAS are in fact being implemented, and, and we actually were able to get a, uh, a second grant to specifically study that. So, so I'm going to take uh, Chair's prerogative to uh, end, end this uh, discussion and, and keep us on schedule, but I'll end it with a comment that, uh, that it seems to me that, it, that a major opportunity for eMERGE, uh, seeing it now uh, from afar, is exactly the transition between discovery and implementation, and that is coming up with a prim principled approach by which you take things from discovery and decide they should be implemented and also create a systems infrastructure for implementing them is, the, is a major opportunity of, of the network that few other networks, because they have a foot in both camps, uh, can look at the transition between them. So with, with that, we're going to move on to the panel presentation and discussion sections of, uh, of the agenda. And our first one is uh, exactly on that topic of discovery and implementation and balancing them. And this, uh, for those of you who aren't looking at the agenda, you'll see a recurrent motif here, which is an eMERGE presenter. Find, uh, followed by a designated reactor, and then a summary by um, a, a, the, the panel uh, discussant chair, if you will. So our eMERGE presenter for discovery versus implementation.